Hello, welcome to Virtual Humans Lecture 12.1, Human Synthesis in a C. In this lecture, we will see how to synthesize static humans in static scenes. We will see how to represent human scene contacts. We will quickly give an overview of um, typical models used to produce multiple outputs conditioned on an input. Um, those are modeled based on variational autoencoders and conditional variational autoencoders, which are used, for example, to synthesize multiple possible human poses conditioned on um, some portion of the scene, for example. And finally, finally, we will see how to synthesize motion, uh, in particular locomotion, in an uneven terrain. We will see how to incorporate the 3D geometry of the terrain into a neural model that will produce um, human motion that is coherent with this terrain. So if in the previous lecture we have seen like methods that perceive humans or capture humans that reconstruct humans from some sort of um, sensor data, in this lecture, the main focus will be to generate virtual human motion condition on the 3D scene geometry and um, and so on. So um, so methods to capture motion um, were, for example, like behave that was capturing human object interaction. And we saw that um, there's methods that can recover to some extent um, human motion or, or human pose and object um, pose from images. Now we will be interested in generating this um, human object or human scene interaction from scratch, right? So that, you know, for example, you can animate a virtual human in an environment in 3D. So of course, like um, the first question we might ask ourselves is why is this um, interesting or useful? Well, at the highest level, we one of the goals of um, in the field of virtual humans is to um, replicate um, like the behavior of your tool of, of real humans and real humans can navigate in the 3d scene can understand what's around them and so um, being able to do the same with an artificial in, um, agent is basically one of the long-standing goals of artificial intelligence now if you want to see uh, more concrete applications of course um, this is useful for gaming where you have to make the characters you know interact with environment and sit for example or grab objects um, this is necessary. Right now, how video games work is by pre-recorded actions, and then basically those actions are launched at particular predefined locations in the scene, which makes it look a little bit unnatural, as we have seen here in this example of GTA, for example. Um, of course, like um, this is useful to um, like train robots to interact with the 3D environment, for example, like it would be quite useful to train virtual agents in a virtual environment before we deploy the physical robots in, in the real space. And of course, for VR and AR applications, um, we mentioned this a little bit in the previous lecture. This is quite useful because like um, we're talking about the shared virtual spaces in some uh, metaverse and uh, those virtual humans that live there, the real ones, and the virtual ones, they need to understand what uh, what the 3D scene around them um, looks like. They, they need to understand what they can do with the scene and the motion generated should be coherent with the scene, right? I mean, for example, like also for social interaction, um, <clears throat> like of course, like one thing that is missing in uh, video calls is like the shared spaces. And um, if you wanna share space, of course, basically these um, renderings of humans in these shared spaces should satisfy the physical constraints of the 3D world. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced that this has extremely many applications. And what do we need actually to synthesize human object interaction? Well, we need to understand, we need to perceive from the perspective of the virtual human, we need to understand the 3D scene. We need to at least reason about affordance and affordance is a concept that um, means that the geometry in a scene affords 
certain types of um, actions. So for example, like a chair affords sitting, but it also affords standing, grabbing it and manipulating it in many different ways. So this is something that is more primitive than um, functionality of objects. So the functionality of objects is that, for example, a chair, the main function, function of a chair is to sit on it, right? The main function of a, of a knife is to use it to cut. But uh, there's many different ways we can grab a knife. There's many different ways we can grab a chair. And there's many different poses, right, that, that, that uh, are afforded by a particular object. So um, ideally, an algorithm should reason both about affordance and also about a function, right? When a little kid is learning about um, the environment and learning to interact with the environment, typically learns the affordances by exploring the environment before the kid really knows what the function of the object is. So um, in my opinion, like a good algorithm should be able to reason about <clears throat> both things um, ideally. And we need to synthesize 3D humans conditioned on the 3D scene. So let's look at some um, examples. These are, again, recent papers. This is a, um, a relatively um, new um, topic. It's something that has interested the computer vision community since the beginning, so since uh, many years ago. But only recently, we have the technology to be able to um, study these things in 3D. So for example, like um, this is um, work that was presented at CBPR, which um, essentially allows you to um, synthesize static humans on the 3D scene. So basically you use the 3D scene um, <clears throat> and then basically the goal is to um, synthesize static poses of humans in that scene in a way that um, it's physically plausible, right? So that people are sitting on chairs or are like um, lying on a sofa without intersecting the environment or without um, like, yeah, having poses that are not um, satisfying the constraints. So how do we go about this? Well, we saw that um, the first thing we need is data. Uh, so we need a good capture method. Like um, I hope by now you realize that there's always a loop between this capture and synthesis, like between this perceiving and modeling. And um, yeah, so for example, like there's this, um, Sorry. Uh, one second. Okay, sorry about that. So basically, we have the prox method that allows you to um, reconstruct the 3D human pose. Um, condition on the scene and this uh, we saw that um, leads to better results it leads um, to resolving intersections with environment and so on and so forth um, so essentially now um, the main problem that we have is that the current models like the simple model do not factor in the scene like you cannot condition the simple model on the scene and so the question is how do we condition the simple model on the scene so um, one possible way, and this is what is done in this work that is called POSA. So um, basically like um, the key idea is based on the human mesh, based on the pose, the idea is to predict the contact vertices, the likely vertices to be in contact with the scene and to predict which objects are likely to be in contact. So these are these two predictions. First, like these vertices that are marked as by the neural network are marked as being likely to be in contact based only on the pose. And, um, and then this like coloring shows which object actually is most likely to be in contact. So here like green means that this bottom part of the human is likely to be in contact with the sofa. And this part of the hand is likely to be in contact with the table. Of course, this is like um, a hypothesis that like this problem is multimodal in the sense that there's multiple solutions um, for a given input. So how is this modeled? So um, how this is modeled is with this um, binary variables that indicate whether a vertex or it, they indicate the likelihood that a vertex is in contact at a given point. For example, like this is FC, which takes values zero or one. So one is when there's contact, zero when there is no contact. And you have one of these binary variables for each of the vertices, BB, in the mesh. 
And then for every vertex, you also have like a matrix or a vector of binary variables, um, one for every object, L, um, L is the number of objects, which indicates which of these objects is likely to be in contact um, for a given pose. So the questions are, well, first, is VI in contact with the scene and which object class is VI actually touching? And um, I mentioned that there's multiple solutions. For example, I could be sitting on a sofa or I could be sitting on a chair or I could be sitting um, on top of a shelf, for example, right? I mean, or a table, right? So this is like, um, there's multiple solutions. So we need to have a predictive model where um, that gives us the possibility to, to sample multiple solutions. So one way to address this is to use um, a generative neural network, like a variational autoencoder or a conditional variational autoencoder. So given a mesh, this network will produce, we can sample here the input and condition on this mesh, and then the network will produce different solutions, which will um, indicate which vertices are likely to be in contact and for those vertices, which objects are actually uh, most likely to be in contact. So now let me give you a refresher on variational autoencoders because this is a technique that um, is often used um, in the context of human modeling. Uh, for example, to model like the pose manifold and also for um, modeling these contacts. Um, so basically like, um, like using bias theorem, like we're typically interested in um, knowing what are the factors Z that cause given observations X, right? And those factors are these quantities of interest. And so basically we're um, typically interested in like obtaining the posterior. These are like the likelihood or the probability of these mm, factors given these observations X. And to solve this, like we typically reverse the problem using bias rule. And then we basically have a likelihood that measures how likely these measurements are produced by these factors Z. Then we have the prior, there's a probability that this prior is actually there, and then divided by the marginal likelihood of the observations. So we have X, which is the evidence, Z, which are the reasons or these latent variables that are the hypotheses. And um, then we have the likelihood of the system. And by using inference, we calculate the posterior to infer these um, latent, latent variables, Z. So in most cases, the posterior does not have a closed form solution and is computationally intractable. So this is where variational inference comes into play because like um, you can use a simpler distribution to approximate this posterior. Now, two questions are how do we define this approximate posterior and how do we perform this approximation? So um, we, we can look at this, um, like um, we want actually the, this approximation to be close to the, to the true unknown um, posterior. So basically like this KL divergence is uh, measuring the distance between the two distributions. Ideally, this distance should be um, small. So we have here that the KL divergence is a measure of, um, of the discrepancy between one distribution and another. In this case, the approximation distribution Q phi of Z condition on X, which is parameterized by phi. This could be a neural network, for example. And, um, and then basically we measure how close it is to the actual posterior we are interested in, like P of Z condition on X. And the definition of the kullback leibler um, uh, divergence is basically like this integral over the um, over Z, which is the latent variable, uh, which and and basically it has the two terms. One term is Q phi of Z conditional on X times the logarithm of um, Q phi uh, divided by P. So things to notice here is that if Q phi and P are equal, then this equals to one, the whole thing equals to zero, the distance is small. And also you have here this discrepancy measured in this logarithm is weighted by Q phi. So wherever you have a high probability mass, like you pay a higher 
cost if you want to think in these terms, right? Um, and so notice that here in this integral, x is not moving. So we are um, fixing x and evaluating this integral um, over z, right? So for every different z, x, we have one of these integrals. So, um, so some properties of the um, KL divergence is that it's non-negative and it's convex, but it's a non-symmetric measure because notice that um, there is, um, it, it does matter where I place, um, like if I reverse the terms and I would pay, place here P of X and then here I would place um, P and replace the Q, it would not give the same quantity. So it's not a symmetric measure. It's not um, a distance in the sense of um, the mathematical sense. So to perform inference, inference, we basically have to minimize the scale divergence. We want to minimize the discrepancy between this approximation and the, the true posterior.